Welcome to an episode of the JetRails podcast. I'm Robert, your host. Today, we're going to be talking uh, about e-commerce conversion rate optimization, uh, a topic that we've touched on a, a few different ways in the podcast historically, and we're going to tackle it uh, a little bit more holistically today. Uh, I've got a guest from the Just Uno team. Uh, Rob is here with us. And Rob, would you do the honors of introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks, Robert. Um, my name is Rob Hammett. I am the director of solutions at Just Uno. Uh, I've been with the company since we. I, I was basically the second hire at the company, so I've seen all of our iterations and have had the pleasure of watching e-commerce as an industry kind of like really flourish uh, in the past eight years. And I've also internally within the company done. <clears throat> everything from product management to strategy to um, managing our entire customer success department to working in sales. And so um, I've had a chance to kind of get involved in everything client facing and in a little bit more deep into product, uh, as well as kind of learning about the industry. Fantastic. And uh, I, I'm going to jump right into one of my favorite uh, questions on the podcast. How did Just Uno get get its name? And seeing as how you've been with the company so early, uh, I'm hoping that you <laughs> you were around for some of those conversations, or at least figured it out, uh, you know, <laughs> early on. This was 10 years ago, by the way, when this when this name came about, and our founders Eric and Travis, they. They've spent a long time in e-commerce running retail brands, uh, so on and so forth. And they had come up with a name and they didn't know exactly what they wanted to do with it. But they they knew that they wanted to build a platform and name it to something that would describe one platform for many different e-commerce marketing needs and, and website needs. So it's basically one platform for for all is, is sort of what the... Um, how I would how I would interpret it. Interesting. Uh, I've known the team for years and years, and uh, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes you just never know. <laughs> yeah, right. No, there's some weird names in tech. Just period. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So circling around um, the the main topic of the day and uh, optimizing a site. Obviously, there's a lot of ways to optimize a lot of things to optimize around. Uh, I know that one of the common ways that uh, that we see merchants um, go to increase their their sales in general, average order value, uh, other key metrics, um, has to do with presenting the right products to shoppers at the right time. So, um, upselling, cross-selling related products, most viewed products, uh, you know, previously viewed products, that you wind up with all of these different competing things, and in different parts of the site in some cases, you know, that uh, uh, if you're going to be cross-sold, usually there's something already in, in your cart or something that you've already purchased uh, that, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, saying, hey, if, if you've got this or you're getting this, then maybe you want this with it too. Maybe you want the case that goes with that cell phone. Um, when is, but there's so many of these that can be inserted. Uh, when it, does it start to generate analysis paralysis is there a good balance for figuring out what and when you should be presenting product to customers because i guess like in a retail situation um you know you put impulse buys at the checkout and you you know have sometimes sales clerks that might uh make recommendations like oh do you want the extended warranty with that um you know do you need the cables that go with that but there's probably a point at which um and I think I've dealt with this at, at at least one cell phone store where you just want to get out of there. <laughs> right, um, right. You, you just don't want anyone trying to upsell you anything else. Actually, GoDaddy is an interesting example of that. If, you, if For anybody that's bought a uh, domain name or SSL or anything from GoDaddy that to get through their checkout, um, it is exhausting. They try to sell you everything. <laughs> it it is it, literally the digital version of approaching the count, the checkout counter at like a 7-Eleven or like a grocery store. It's just weaving through upsells, like all the way to the point where you're trying to get to. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think that it's kind of a challenge that some merchants don't know what to add or when to add. Is it is it about test and measure? Is it about the industry they're in, the, the dollar value of their products? Do you have some kind of feeling for 
when a, uh, an e-commerce site is trying to figure out what, how to leverage showing off products in the right time and place? Yeah. So you said a few key words there, balance being the most key. The other key words being how, what, where, why, when. Um, understanding, I think <clears throat> you have to understand your audience to put the right things in front of them. And grocery stores can't really do this because they got one checkout for everybody, right? But e-commerce websites very much have that power and and should exercise it. So you know, the average order value is a great question to ask yourself in terms of, you know, in terms of what you can hope to upsell. Um, if you have a very high value product that's in the cart and you're up, or in your cross selling a, a gift or something like that, or something that is less expensive, let's say you're selling a couch and you, and you say, if you buy this couch today, um, we'll give you these slip covers for 15% off, you know, like that's going to be a very tempting purchase for someone who's already ready to shell out that kind of money. Um, and then it's probably, you know, I would say maybe even a little bit easier for, for lower AOV stores, but it's all about, you know, I, I talk to people about understanding when, and most importantly, why they're doing that, right. Is does this person already have an item in their cart? Um, or are you showing an upsell banner just because you're hoping to get them to put the first item in their cart? Yeah, you know they're uh, looking you, at at you know uh, back to my cell phone example. They're looking at right. at something that's got you know 64 gigabytes of storage, and you want them to get you know or, or a gigabyte of storage, and you want them to get the larger one, um, spend right. a little bit more while they're at it, or get the bigger screen version, the, the XL version. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly, and and like they uh, you know. At understanding the the funnel, I think, and really evaluating your funnel or flywheel, if you're if you're thinking in that context of your marketing, is is saying you know like in your example, like I keep visualizing a actual like Verizon store or something like that, where you walk in and a bad sales associate would see you walk in and say. Hey, can I get you a, a case with your cell phone today? That would be a bad move, right? They would, but if you had returned to the store a few times and you picked up a few phones and they were, and then you put the phone on the counter, your intent to buy is higher. So you're not, you're not bothering a potential customer with irrelevant messaging or irrelevant promotions. Like you're, you're showing, you're, you're using, you're tailoring and you're targeting and personalizing those offers to those people. And we certainly work with a lot of brands that do, they run a multitude of different upselling and cross-selling promotions to different customers based on what they have in their cart or where they came from or so on and so forth. That's interesting. You know, to me, some of this is just natural. It's second nature that this is how you would want to, uh, to operate as an e-commerce store. But I see a lot of stores that do this poorly or, or really don't do it at all, that they don't leverage these feature sets more than maybe whatever just is standard, whatever is is you know on by default uh, in their e-commerce platform. Do you have a feeling for why um, more e-commerce stores aren't leveraging data to serve this stuff up well? Well, it's a mix and I you kind of you kind of were alluding to it, but um, it's a mix of either not having time to do it or, uh, or they're using so-called best practices. And I, and I, you know, and I don't, ex you know, they, they don't expand from there, uh, from those best practices sometimes because of a bait, a very, you know, kind of like marginal uptick in ROI. So they, so they think it's working rather than continuing to iterate. Right. And I have to, I always go back to this. John McDonald from The Good uh, CRO Agency. If you haven't seen them, they're a very forward-thinking um, uh, CRO agency that I've that I've had conversations with John. Um, he summed it up so eloquently uh, what I had come to realize and start preaching myself that best practices are for beginners, right? Understand what generally works and use best practices as a starting point and then start to pull the levers until you find what works for you right and so that's where i think when you talk about <clears throat> not enough brands 
are doing this. And I totally agree. And I would go a step further and say the bigger the brand, the worse they are at it, generally speaking, like in my experience. And, um, and so I would say that these best practices, when John said best practices are for beginners, it just resonated with me. And I was like, oh my God, that's such an easier way to say all these things I've been talking about with, with, with customers. It's so nice to hear that validated is because you, you start with the best practice because you hadn't done anything before. You see a basic R, uh, uptick in ROI from like from KPI metrics that are, are very top level, right? Like, so you see your, um, you know, you see the amount of emails going into your system going up, but are you looking at the bounce rate? Are you, or, you know, are you looking at the lifetime value of those emails? You know, like, are you digging deeper? And so for those well, that- And I suppose even as it relates to like individual products in a store that depending on how you merchandise and what you merchandise, how you relate things and, uh, you know, what metrics you're using to determine what shows up and where, maybe this works with, you know, one category of products or, or brand of products better than another. And, you know, maybe it's worth eating up real estate and being more, I don't, I don't want to use a negative, but intrusive to the shopping experience to make these recommendations to shoppers, you know, based upon certain uh, products or data points versus others. And I think that's a, you know, that's part of the, the hard part as well. It's like the all or nothing. Oh, I tried that and it didn't work for me. Well, it did. You just didn't look at your data. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of times, but I don't necessarily fault merchants for that a lot of times because in my experience, you know, a lot of them are SMBs. They've got a million things on their plate. They're, you know, they're, they're working with brands like Jet Rails and Just, you know, and Magento. And they're also working with an agency. They're being pulled in a lot of different directions and they really need a quick solution and they're delighted to see it, right? They're, 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 they're really happy to see that. And so they think it works, right? And they don't, they don't necessarily, they're not like people like us that are so, you know, kind of data obsessed and testing obsessed and like kind of making, you know, that's our job in the industry, right? Like that it's our job to do that and, and bring those recommendations to the table. And I, I think one of the other challenges that I've run into is that they think that whatever they, whatever came with their platform is sufficient. <laughs> and, um, right. The problem is that a, a lot of platforms natively don't digest the data and use AI or you know some variation thereof uh, to make better decisions to figure out what the shoppers are going to react to to to. Uh, split test different things and see what's going to work best. And I, I think that's probably uh, the linchpin here because when this is done well, it's data driven. I mean, there are, there are obvious things that you can do, but when you start dealing with a bigger product catalog, it gets really hard to, to really curate which products should be shown at which times it's time consuming um, yeah, to figure this stuff out. Humans aren't going to do that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how human I am, but, you know, I can do an amount of it, but <laughs> there, there's yeah, a breaking yeah. point to doing it well um, and, and being cost effective and time effective. Uh, right. So I, I think that that might play in a little bit. Um, you know, have you found that users of a particular e-commerce platform have are at least more likely to have gotten their feet wet and started like Magento for years and years has at least had a lot of these base features for related products, upsells and cross sells specifically. Um, you know, so at least they've maybe dabbled and they have something in use on their site, uh, even if they aren't really using a lot of um, a, a lot of you know AI or machine learning or or anything that that uh, might enhance this for them and automate it for them. You know, I find it's interesting. I find that Magento customers that come to us that uh, w that are interested in our AI product recommendations, Magento customers tend to have a firm grasp on the on the concept of AI product recommendations because of Magento's sort of built-in features, uh, which I very much appreciate. But I, I, I mean, I'm not sure I can point to a specific platform where brands aren't aware of wanting to expand on things like AOV or, you know, upselling and cross-selling simply because merchants demand so much from the ecosystems that they work within. Right. And, and Magento is no exception. No big commerce is no exception. And obviously Shopify. Um, we, 
it, they, they demand so much from the ecosystem that we all have to work together to make sure it's as seamless as possible from them. Um, I think, of course, SaaS platforms with app marketplaces can more easily expose merchants to this tech. But I hear from pretty much everyone now in terms of recommendations, upselling, cross-selling. Most brands that are, I would say, very serious brands, whether they're small or large, but they're serious brands, they know. They're aware. They talk to other merchants. The merchants say, hey, this is working. Um, It's not just the ecosystem. It's also the word of mouth. And merchants are very well connected with each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's interesting that I mean, and I, I suppose that's how most things work, especially in today's world where we're all hyper connected and uh, information sharing is, is certainly easier than ever. Um, mm-hmm. And when it comes to what actually works, obviously, a lot of this is data driven. Um, it, it's surely data driven. But I imagine that the initial concepts and the ways that things are presented that you know, the technology that stacks like yours offer in the first place probably relies heavily on psychology to figure out. Um, and, and that's where I think the root of conversion rate optimization of CRO comes from that, uh, you know, when it, when we're talking about supermarkets and impulse buys and the layouts yeah. of these stores I've talked about on the podcast before, you know, they put the milk in the back corner. Look, Costco knows to put those $5 rotisserie chickens all the way in the back of the store because they know that the chances you're going to get back there get to the checkout and not have picked up a few other items is pretty negligible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mean, know, so- everything, everything is psychology, right? Like, I mean, I think, you know, as you're saying that I'm like, wow, I, I can't really think of anything that isn't like landscaping is psychology, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, there's, there isn't much that I can't point to, you know? Yeah. yeah it's, uh, I, I think, you know, it's always just interesting to look back on how some of these things get developed. And, um, you know, we know that, for instance, you know, shoppers are always in, in a rush that the the loading speed has such a direct impact. Um, so I, I always just have fun with it. You know, I, I try to at face value, when you look at all these things, they seem really simple. But when you really think about the people part of the equation <laughs> and, right. um, and think about Wow, you know, somebody can't spare an extra, you know, two seconds, or, um, mm. or you know, so someone's really going to make a different purchase based upon that little thing. But yeah, you know, that's yeah. really how our world works. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I go ahead. Yeah, I, I wonder. Um, there are a lot of you know different ways of presenting this kind of information to users. Some of which is considered more of a nuisance. Um, some of which converts better. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the time there are, uh, you know, different banners showing up, um, you know, pop-ups, overlays, m- modals, whatever we want to refer to the different styles as, um, but typically within the same window, not, not popping out as its own, uh, its own mm-hmm. screen anymore, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, have you found that, um, and has your team found that that has a major impact uh, one one way or the other, uh, you know, that are shoppers really uh, bothered by some of that? Um, can that lead to some frustration uh, and cause friction or, or do, do those typically work? I know like I I'm so over having to accept uh, the cookie terms and data consent on the top or bottom of every website now that uh <laughs> It's basically how I feel, you know, normally in a normal year when I'm flying all over the place and I have right. to be told how a seatbelt works. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. We all know. <laughs> yeah. We're all right. Side, side note, I might need that reminder because I have not flown once this year, which is insane for me. So mm-hmm. makes two of us. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. But yeah, to, to, to your point, I think, uh, I, I, I find it so paramount that this gets addressed. Psychology helps you understand, but empathy helps you apply it, right? And that sort of goes into uh, what, sort of what you're talking about with distraction, frustration, experience. Like a lot of brands get this wrong. Um, HubSpot put out a 
absolutely spot on hilarious video a couple of years back called why marketers can't have nice things. And it's because we break them, right? And it's video and it's pop-ups and it's email and it's going to be SMS pretty soon. And, uh, and, you know, and what we need to do is we need to break that cycle. But to answer your question, like it's, it's interesting when you talk about what we internally, we call like operational messaging versus promotional messaging. So we have like, you know, um, you, you know, you're talking about cookie and data consent, uh, banners versus, you know, get 10% off your email. I think those are very different. It's hard to say how the non-marketer feels about what I might call operational messaging. Um, like this year, for example, is going to be very interesting because a lot of people need to talk on their website about shipping delays. Um, and that's that's a very real thing. That's very real operational messaging that needs to be in place so that c- customers feel like those needs are being addressed, right? Well, and, but, and I think that's just it, that at least that I would as a shopper, and I try not to use myself as a barometer for everyone else too often because I have industry knowledge and you know have a unique vantage point on these things but i look at that in some ways as saying this site is up to date it's relevant they're active they care um they're communicating effectively and and that to me at least speaks speaks well of the the site that i'm looking at um i'm not as bothered by that as maybe you know these uh, overlays and things that are asking me about reading terms and conditions that we all know nobody's reading. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all about how you do it. You know, like I really like how Patagonia does it. Uh, and you know, like, and again, as you were saying, like we're kind of circling around the same point where it's like maybe a non-marketer, maybe that's someone that's not in our industry is like these, you know, God, these, co- these cookie banners, blah, blah, blah. But to me, they signal that the company is 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 aware of GDPR and Castle and CCPA and sort of this movement towards data privacy and putting the consent in the users' hands. So, us being in an industry, of course, we're like, well, that's nice. You know, that's that's nice of them to do. You know, whether or not we read the terms and conditions. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I suppose that you know that's that's interesting that you flipped my own way of thinking back on me. Good for you, sir. You, you, <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to give score one for one of the Robs, and I'll just leave yeah, it at yeah. that. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll play. It's one, it's one to one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when people ignore banners or exit them, you know, when they, they click out of it, does anything actually happen? Is there useful data uh, in any of that? Yeah. So 99% of the time websites are, and this might not be a surprise to your listeners, but you know, I would, I would stress this to anybody not in our industry that 99% of the time they are informing you that they are using cookies to improve your experience and get you to buy more stuff, but they're, they're doing it to inform you and you can decline some of the more advanced ones will let you have yes. con- various consent options, right? But they're informing you that if you continue, it's implicit uh, consent. Because it, it, I guess it's like signing when you go into an event that's recording where you're saying that, uh, you know, you know that there's going to be pictures and video of you and it can be used. Right. However, uh, exactly. y- you've just accepted that you walked into a store that's got a, a digital version of cameras running, tracking you. Uh, yeah. And they're going to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For security, for this and that, you know, it's, it's, I think that you, you were just talking about like a, a, I think a concert, you know, or like when you go into a comedy show or something, you know, remember those uh, and, and you walk in and they're like, we'll be doing a recording. And by sitting down in your seat, you're basically agreeing to do that. And that's similar to, to this case. And I, you know, I wish we could get a lot of, uh, you know, shoppers to listen to this podcast, to, to talk, to listen to that. But that's, you know, just so they know, you know, that's, that's 99% of the case that's what's happening. But you look at a Patagonia, for example, uh, and they will say, accept all cookies or view my cookie options. They have a pretty sophisticated, Mm -hmm. as far as banners go, it's pretty sophisticated. I will admit that I do when, when you get the advanced ones, I, I use them. <laughs> I, yeah, I make choices, yeah. but but oddly enough, because I want to see what companies are doing, I don't always turn everything off because that's 
you know, the role that I play in the world, uh, right. you know, that, that there are times when I don't mind them tracking me and serving me up information because that helps me to understand uh, what their best practices look like and, and what they're up to. Uh, and right. and gives me more to talk about on the podcast. So, uh, yeah, and exactly. you know, so kind of circling back to these um, pop ups and other things, um, is there some kind of a, you know, and, and we'll go back to the word balance of of healthy versus unhealthy? Because if you've got this stuff for this year for COVID, you've got stuff for uh, you know certainly for consents and other things. You've got. You know, depending on what kind of store, if they're selling, let's say, alcohol, of course, they're going to have something about, you know, your age. Uh, in a lot of cases, they'll have something asking for an email address or to otherwise engage with the site. There might be something offering a coupon or some discount. Mm -hmm. Like everything else here, I, I know that um, the, the balance is key. Is there sort of an order of operations here or is there a breaking point where if we have to give the user so much necessary information that we basically it's it's almost tying up that space or that that acceptance of i'm not going to click out any more things like i just you know this site's just frustrating right i i feel i feel for the uh let's call them like liquor stores that sell online but have a brick and mortar presence that will be shipping for the holidays right they're going to put operational messaging about age verification they're going to put operational messaging about shipping delays for COVID, and they're going to put geolocation. If they're sophisticated, they're going to geo target visitors based on them being in a local area and say, hey, you can pick up curbside at our store at blah, 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 Doheny Road, right? Or whatever it is. And so they have to put all those things out. And the rest of it, they're also trying to do promotional messaging. They're also trying to increase AOV and, and conversion rate. So I think it's you. Honestly, it's just using psychology and again, this word empathy to just be a human marketing to humans. You would not talk to a stranger um, the way that some of these brands talk to you on their website, right? Like here, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, hey, you know, like you you probably wouldn't do that, right? Um, and A-B testing against controls, limiting pop-ups, limiting promotional pop-ups, to one to two max per visit, prioritizing operational messaging. And also you, you had said the word digital real estate earlier, right? Use digital real estate on the borders for your operational messaging. If you're looking to really engage, if you're look for, looking for someone to really interact with certain messaging, put it in the middle of your page, right? And if that's an email signup, which it typically is, that's typically the most important goal for a new visitor, right? Then, mm -hmm. then do that, right? Yeah, and I suppose, you know, and so you talk about targeting, you know, a certain number per session. I think that's an important distinction, the ability to use data to know what someone has already seen, what frequency, uh, you know, there's a blog that I read regularly and, every, and it's from a major company. And every time I go there, um, as soon as I move my mouse in the wrong direction, it's oversensitive. Um, it gives me uh, a message, you know, wait, wait, don't go anywhere. Like, okay, guys. <laughs> I'm, I was I'm just clicking to that. Yeah, I was just, I was just moving up to your menu. Like, you know, yeah. everything's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not abandoning you. Like, it's, it's yeah. all right. Um, yeah. You know, the same thing. Obviously, I, if I have a problem exiting one of these screens that that's you know overlaying you know some kind of light box or something that's that's coming up at me. Um, or if um, uh, if it's sized improperly for my screen, so like I'm on mobile and it's hard to close out these things, obviously that's a, a deal breaker. <laughs> That'll yeah. potentially chase me off if it's not something that I'm really, you know, really hungry for uh, at, at that point. And not only you and not only you and, yeah. and that's something that you hope and I've experienced Plenty of times, like, you know, um, the the merchant themselves is like, hey, red flag, red flag alert. We got something going on. And, you know, my balance rate went up to 95 percent. What's going on? And yeah. then so you hope that, that you they're, they're watching their data and you hope that they're testing their own site on different devices uh, yes. and, and that they're not just assuming that everything is good uh, right. and, and that it's a good user experience. So I think that's uh, a, a big part of the challenge. And, you know, it can also have impacts uh, outside of just conversions. So. Um, last I knew, Google was uh, tamping down on on a lot of those uh, friction points. Um, 
you know, are basically do merchants today have to be more limited in what they can display and how they display it in order to avoid uh, being heard in SEO rankings or um, ha- having impacts on their Google ads and other ad campaigns? Well, indeed, I think it's focused on mobile. Um, it's, you know, we're, it's a mobile first world now. And three years ago, we kept talking about it's going to be a mobile first world soon. And we're there. Right. And, um, and so certain browsers, certain channels, uh, like if you're clicking through on a SERP to the first page of the website, you need to make sure that pop-ups do not cover that main content of the site. Uh, and you, you know, otherwise if it's covering the main content and, and it's the first click after the SERP, then you know, you're going to get dinged by a Google on mobile, right? But there are other nuanced things, right? Like you can present something that takes up 25% of the screen size. And the nuances are make sure that the clickable elements on this pop-up, especially close buttons and especially CTAs are big, easily clickable with the thumb on an even an iPhone 5, Right. And just make sure those elements are are very easy to interact with and you'll be fine. Yeah. And out of all the things that you see people put into these pop-ups and banners and other other uh, additions um, that are more personalized, that don't always necessarily show, uh, you know, the entire time that they're on the site, but that are exitable uh, in some way or other, closable. Are there any interesting ones that have been coming up or any favorites that just stay strong. So I know I was mentioning earlier things like coupons and, um, you know, it's nice to capture people's email addresses, cell phone numbers, um, you know, offering to connect through Facebook Messenger is something that's come about. Uh, Anything stand out? I mean, you know, getting them involved in a contest. Uh, Obviously, uh, different brands are going to have better experiences with different uh, offerings based upon their target audience. Uh, but any major winners that you think more people should be looking at or, or just overall are worth c- at least considering if it's a fit? Yeah. 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 And you, you clearly, Rob, have your finger on the pulse um, because you're talking about it's it's sort of a matrix. Uh, well, I, right? I am the doctor of e-commerce, right? So that, oh, oh, OK. Yes. <laughs> right now. Now that's well, stick. doctor. Well, doctor. Yes, I would say that uh, in. In in what I've seen throughout the years, segmenting paid traffic from organic traffic is crucial. And you want to capture leads from both. I think capturing the lead, it's it's not very likely unless your AOV is like under $30, which is an important question to ask yourself. What's my AOV, right? Uh, It's important to understand that you probably... Our people probably aren't going to buy the first time they get to their site. It's been doc, well documented over and over and over again. That Great makes conversion sense. Low average course. order value. Sure, they're just going to buy and move on. But anything else, there's a journey. They're researching. They might, you know, engage with you a few more times before they actually, uh, you know, get through right. the checkout. Yeah, sure. Back to the back to the furniture versus the sunglass store example. I think um, it's it's a very important distinction. So you have to ask yourself that and. I think in any case, it's very important to to segment lead capture. So first that, then understand that new visitors capture a lead, get that initial yes, because going back to consumer psychology, if you get someone to say yes to to something small, you can probably get them to say yes to something bigger. And that's not something meant to manipulate. It's just not uh, trying to go home with someone on the first date. (laughs) I, I, that's the only example I came to mind. I don't know why, but um, I'm going to hold it against you. I okay, okay. Really. So I, I get no, my I, point taken away. I get my no, score. We've taken definitely away. talked about um, e-commerce shoppers mm-hmm. that way on on this podcast before. You're okay. in good company. Okay, so so get the initial yes. Get the email because you probably, especially if your AOV is a little bit higher, you're going to need to nurture those people. If I'm in the market for a couch, which I am, I'm not. I am going to do so much research. I'm going to order swatches. I'm going to, you know, do this and that and the other thing. And if I'm coming, you know, furniture companies often pay a lot for uh, traffic, right? Their cost per acquisition is much higher than a lower AOV brand, right? Because think about it, how much it, it costs to acquire that visitor 
and then how much it costs to nurture them all the way to the point that they purchase, right? And so it's a very long cycle for, for companies like that. And so I always talk to people about this. And then going to your contest example, regardless of AOV, we have historically seen that contest giveaways specifically work so much better to uh, to acquire paid traffic into leads because it's a low risk, high reward incentive. So someone comes to your site from a paid channel, from an ad, think about their intent. It's very low. They have a very high bounce rate. But if you can get something in front of them that is like, hey, you could win a $300 gift card, or you could win a trip to Miami or whatever it is, then someone will say, all right, that's worth my email. Sure. You know, and conversely, this gets into a lot of CRO tax tactics. My favorite, you're asking about my favorite goodie, it would be gift with purchase. I think in, in keeping that type of incentive to, um, to organic and direct traffic is what will ultimately speak to that group. The discounts, I try to leave those. I would leave those for your win back campaigns because then you'll find people who have a discount affinity. And those are people that are only going to buy when you when you offer them a discount. And that's great, but you don't want to give the discount to everybody, right? Like only the people that need it. The other thing that I've always liked about giving free gifts is that if there's some kind of a, uh, a manufacturer's pricing that you need to follow, um, if you've got map pricing from, uh, from whatever... Uh, you know, uh, brands yeah. that you're reselling, mm -hmm. you can often give them a free gift with, with the purchase. And that can be the difference between them buying from you and the other hundred places that are selling the same thing at the same price, uh, because they're not allowed with the same to guidelines. Yeah. yeah. With the same so, map guidelines. Yeah. So that's a fun one that I, I think applies to more businesses, uh, than, uh, than people realize, uh, mm -hmm. that does well. Hey, you'd be surprised at what a free keychain or t-shirt or whatever can we can do for you right you know you go into store to possibly buy one thing and you say okay well i can get two you know or you know you want to combine aov with the free gift with purchase you know, like if you're going to buy that couch maybe they're going to give you a free you know cleaning solution kit for you know when you uh, uh accidentally drip some of that red wine on it uh of course you know or well, i don't know wh whatever it, it may be that you know the throw pillows or yeah. they know what what's going to move the needle or hopefully uh, if they don't yet yeah, they're listening to this and they're going to figure it out pretty quickly um, all of you out there offer the cleaning solution because i don't want to go somewhere else to buy the cleaning solution. You're the one that knows what cleaning solution works best. So you give me the cleaning solution with my couch purchase. I'm yours. See that? See, that's all that we really want listeners. Okay. We just want cleaning solution with our couches. Really? Yes, if, know, if everyone just the red wine, that. the red wine is a very real example. You know what? Yeah. If they threw in a bottle of red wine with the cleaning solution on the couch, I, I think you'd buy two couches. I don't know where you'd put them, but I think you'd buy two. I think that nets out to an even because you're going to spill the wine and then you're going to use the cleaning solution. But yeah, I mean, anything you can add in there is great. And I think they took that, care of you twice. I mean, how much more can you ask for? <laughs> obviously, every, every, obviously, everybody in the commercial spills wine on their couches. So that's right. Or on the infomercial. So just just, you know, skip that part and give well, us the give us the cleaning solution. I think that's the funny part about some of this is that, you know, from my experience, sometimes it's not the thing that you think. Um, that's going to get people excited or get them to do a double take to think about it, to just slow down long enough to build some relationship there, to think of your website, your store as an individual uh, brand with people, with, you know, with its own personality and not just, you know, a place that they're shopping for commodities that, uh, you know, that's Amazon and that's fine. But, you know, you don't want to be Amazon. You want to really, you know, exude some personality and build some relationship and yeah. be seen and remembered uh, as unique. So that, and speaking of, um, to, to pivot a little bit, we've been talking a lot about what happens on site, uh, but a lot of communications have to happen off site. And, you know, and, you know, here I was asking about, you know, do we collect email addresses? Do we get people to engage with social? Uh, you know, do you find that, you know, that merchants are doing a good job of communicating with shoppers across 
uh, these different mediums where they are. You know, so for instance, a lot of people are very fast to delete email, but they might be more likely to engage with content being sent to them through other mediums. Uh, any direct feelings around that and, and what's happening on market and, or should be happening? Yeah, I mean, email's not going anywhere. So, so everybody's doing it. And as far as I think a lot of branching out into uh, seeing success in SMS and and uh, in like Facebook Messenger and push. Really, those are like the four main, uh, you know, want owned data marketing channels, right? And so, and, and you know, retargeting to some extent. But I think that um, I think social media is really the crux. It's it's like the uh, the cradle of where email and SMS meet because you have this one-on-one communication largely on mobile devices that is not, Hey, I'm, I'm weaseling my way into your, into your, into your text messages, right? I'm, I'm in your social, I'm, you know, giving you a notification because I'm reposting this or, or whatever kind of organic, um, sort of development of community that you're doing on social. So I really think that social is that perfect kind of crux. Um, and you know, I'm I'm not a big fan. In case you couldn't tell already, like I I I'm not a big fan of SMS marketing. Um, myself as a shopper, I've seen the success it's had with brands that I've worked with. Um, so well, I think it's kind of like that, necessary. Well, I, I'm not a big Instagram user. You know, there are right. brands that do great marketing there, but they wouldn't get me there. So right, right, uh, yeah. you know that I I I'll give it that that in the data that there are going to be segments that it's going to be really good with. It might not be you and me. I mean, I I know, uh, yeah. you know, I, I got more promotional uh, text messages in the last couple of months um, leading up to the election because I'm in a swing yeah. state and and what yeah. have you that I was, uh, you know, I was just, you know, uh, submitting back, you know, as spam and such. Like, you know, I, I don't want, I don't know who yeah. you are. Don't, you know, don't want to know. Uh, you yeah. know, th- this isn't helping anybody. Uh, you know that that yeah. I. I actually think that where in email, I might've just deleted it for, I probably should click spam if I get that email, but right. through SMS, I rely on that as a steadier communication path. I actually find the transactional messages I prefer there. So like letting me know that the the order is at my doorstep um, and has been delivered. I don't mind getting that um, through SMS, yeah. but I don't enjoy getting quite as many uh, you know promotional messages that way, unless it's really spot on yeah like unsolicited versus alert uh, you you're you're right like when i have a, a package that's arriving or is on the way and i get a text about that i'm actually fine with that but you know i i rarely sign up for sms marketing uh, in fact i never do um but you know like we're kind of talking maybe it's my age i don't know i don't want to assume what your age is but i have a feeling that we're probably in in the, a similar group where it, we it just missed us. But I that said, that being said, mm-hmm. I well, look, I mean, the, the people listening to this podcast probably assume that I'm in my 60s. The people seeing me on camera probably think I just got out of high school. So <laughs> we'll just leave it at somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. OK, but I was going <laughs> to say that, like we work with plenty of brands that, you know, obviously it's the TikTok era. It's the it's the Instagram era. And there's many millennial and, and even more important Gen Z focused brands. And they do great with SMS because that audience is largely on their phones. They're largely getting information from their, from social media or from, or from text. Um, and so we just, you know, it's, it's a generational thing to it and it's generational and it's transactional. So I, I always talk about this. Like if you are selling, if you're selling, um, you know, insoles, let's say, uh, in like really padded insoles, you're probably not going to be selling that to Gen Zers. So you're probably going to have a lot of success on Facebook and email. You know, if you're selling rave gear, probably going to have a lot more success on SMS. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, understanding know again, your understand audience. Your, yeah. Yeah. Know your audience. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. And, you know, all these things that we're, we're talking about, I know we've talked a little bit about, AI and 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 obviously a little bit about knowing your own audience, knowing where to start. 
if if you had to describe what a healthy breakdown is of you know of of the right staffing and the right technology, um, you know, is a lot of it really done by the machines now? I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> am I going to be George Jetson soon enough pushing the red button one time a day and being exhausted from it? Uh, yeah. or, or, you know, is a lot of this really about coming up with the right messaging and testing and measuring and is a lot of it changing over time as consumer preferences are changing. Uh, and so it's a moving target. Do you have a feel for, you know, for what the data suggests about, um, you know, about how much human intervention is still needed to do this right? I hope plenty. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hope cause my job depends on it. Um, <laughs> AI is great, I think, to crunch numbers and big data sets. Uh, you were talking earlier, you know, like I, I've worked with uh, auto parts stores, specifically um, auto parts and tools, utility websites. They have massive, ever growing product catalogs that humans just they won't do. They won't crunch those numbers to know which product to recommend or which A B test to run. And I think it's it's frankly good to do those. It's good for AI to do those things that humans aren't going to do and run through a spreadsheet or like a pivot table, you know, um, you know, or be, you know, like knowing what product to put in front of someone because of an item that they already have in a cart, right? I also think AI's place is in data, right? Not necessarily pulling the levers for us, but pointing to where we should be pulling the levers. And Good. I strongly Let's believe that. Let's not I, give Skynet any of the weapons just yet. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. And I don't like, I really, it's it's disturbing to see these, you know, AI sentient robot with plastic skin looking like humans kind of thing. Like it's disturbing, right? Like it's like, it's, you know, this well, isn't I, minority report, right? I don't like, know. I mean, I'm stuck in this office all day that if I have to make friends with a robot, I, I suppose. But <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden the robot becomes your therapist and you're learning all these things that you didn't know, you know? <laughs> hey, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting what, what we can, when we start to empathize with inanimate objects, uh, I think it teaches us something really interesting. Um, and there's a huge history of that. I mean, you know, Walt Disney enjoyed getting crowds to cry in, in a theater watching, you know, Bambi or watching. There were intense moments on purpose that to, to be able to from just some drawings that they basically scanned in, um, adding some, you know, some sound, some music, some what have you, being able to to elicit emotion from that on a higher level um, is intense. And so I, I do think that there's a lot of power here. Um, from the psychology standpoint, above and beyond what a, a lot of us give credit for, um, to giving someone a good experience and to uh, helping them to interact quickly and effectively, to really guiding them through a process in a way that's not rote, that's not um, exactly the same for everyone, because not every shopper is exactly the same, depending on uh, what they're looking for, how they they came in, what they've purchased in the past, all these data points um, there, there are likelihoods and there are things that look as a shopper, Irons, I do like when, when yeah. the store, you know, I mean, it's like having a personal shopper. It's actually nice. You know, when, uh, you know, if you're shopping for, uh, you know, formal wear, something that I haven't had to wear to trade shows in, in a few years, really. Uh, right. <laughs> but, uh, but back in the day, you know, Before you, the corn, yeah. Yeah, you know that. Well, that that too. But you you know you show up and there's someone that hopefully you build a relationship with over time, and they kind of know what your style is and what you're more likely to be looking for and what your goals are. And you can get through the process faster. You can walk out happier. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, same reason that when you walk into again in normal times the barber shop or whatever, you have a relationship and uh, and there's some history there of what you like and don't like, and um, and you're like more patterns. likely to walk out happy. Yeah. It's like, um, it's like patterns, you know, like we have, uh, like I'm a bargain hunter. I like to go to expensive, you know, menswear sites and find the cheapest stuff that's, I find stylish. And I like to buy that. So if AI determines to that, that merchant to, you know, wax London is a great example of a company that I purchase gear from sometimes, like if they, if they find that most of their shoppers look for 
new arrivals on the cheaper end, or, you know, like they're not buying the most expensive stuff, then AI can tell them, Hey, put the, you know, put some of the best, put the best sellers up front that are, you know, have a price point that's a little less intimidating than, you know, your brand new pet, you know, uh, Pico that's like $500. Right. You know? And so, well, and that's where I think also, you know, segmentation and split testing and different things come in because you might find that offering certain things to the shoppers that are known to go to your closeout section or specials or whatever that, that are shopping for that, that are looking for a great deal, might be much more likely to react to other great deals and things that come up versus shoppers that you know are generally just, you know, they love the brand, they're going to they're going to pay whatever the cost is. They're they're going to buy consistently, um, and in some cases without having to return too many times to think about it. And so, why get in the middle of that? You know, just help them through that process. Uh, yeah, you know, so that you know, pulling in some of the things that that you've brought up already. Um, I I think that there there's a, a lot to be said for for that mix of knowing what to set up and who to set it up for, and then testing and measuring and seeing what really happens. Uh, and letting the AI run with it and improve it and, you know, really figure out the nuts and bolts of, of what works the best. Um, right. You know, so it, it was kind of cool. Uh, you know, I, I, and there's, there's so much data that that's actionable that people don't uh, really leverage these days. And I think that's, uh, that's the trouble is that we're collecting more and more data and um, large enterprises by and large, I think are doing a better job of leveraging it, but that some of that hasn't funneled down uh, into SMB and mid-market as much that uh, if you only use the data that you had, that, uh, uh, you know, how, how much better a store could you be? Um, you know, do you find that a lot of merchants are varying offers in different ways and and varying these things like if if the shopper is on mobile versus desktop or they're in a different location geographically are there a lot of stores that test those things because they you know there are differences in how um how the, these different shoppers that are in different parts of their journey are interacting differently with the site uh you know or, or just come from different backgrounds might interact yeah i mean i i think that I love the people I love working with most are mom and pop shops who are really into testing because they're determined to find actionable results and they have the, the most, uh, the meagerest means to do so. Because usually it's like, you know, you're looking at, you're looking for high confidence ratings, right. And statistical significance in your tests. Um, we offer that as a, as a, measure in our AB testing. And I know that a lot of companies do such as, you know, like you look at the optimized and everything of the world. And so typically, you know, to boil it down to really hard numbers, we like usually look for about 10,000 sessions or 30 days to establish confidence in our, in our testing. So when you talk about actionable insights, that's what we're talking about. It's some, some of the time these SMBs don't have it takes them a long time to get to 10,000 sessions, which is totally fine. And, but they're, they're obsessed with growth. They're obsessed with data. And so, uh, so I think that those people do offer vary their offers and they tend to, they tend to co communicate the most with our internal teams and say, Hey, what are you guys seeing? What can we do to improve? And they're hungry. They're, they're scrappy They're And I love working with those people. And, um, we also, I also really anybody, I guess that's like kind of scrappy and into the data. Like I've worked with Bella and canvas, who's like one of the largest, um, wholesale t uh, apparel, uh, um, businesses in America and, um, you know, various other mid side, like Pura Vita bracelets and, mm. and a lot that's of fun. different, a lot of different brands that I've personally wor worked with and gotten really close with who really want to know what's working and they want to change these offers up. Um, based, you know, regardless of their volume, um, they want to engage visitors differently. I think it's, it's, I think it's sort of a mentality versus like a certain size of a store that tends mm -hmm. to vary their offers. Cause I've seen stores yeah, at I, every level. I, I, not and, and I think if nothing else, like some of the, sometimes merchants throw out a number. So the 10% discount or the food, 
I don't think enough of them test to figure out what the right number is. Um, right. You know, I I appreciate those that don't offer discounting at all because, uh, you know, th th they're able to command their list price or they just price themselves in a way that the market's going to react to. Um, mm -hmm. There are some segments where I think there are there is a core group of shoppers out there that have a hard time finishing checkout without a working promo code. <laughs> Uh, yeah. you know, we, we love them. Um, uh, you know, I, I can't say, I mean, look, you know, knowing that it takes a few seconds to Google looking for a promo code, I can't say that I've never caught myself spending an extra couple of minutes and getting lost in the process because I'm trying promos that don't work or trying to find the best one. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 sometimes there are brands that I've advised, just put up a page on your site and offer the best thing that you're ever going to offer and don't offer anything more than that ever. Um, you know, you don't want those coupon shoppers getting lost going from, I don't know, retail me not to coupon cabin to coupon follow to whatever. So, you know, I used to submit a lot of sites to a lot of these that, you know, mm -hmm. that had coupons, uh, the sites that, that were into that. Um, a lot of my, a lot of my merchant friends would be bummed to hear this, but I am so unabashedly a discount shopper. Like I, I use that app honey or that web mm -hmm. extension honey and it works so well. And a lot of my friends who own small to medium sized <laughs> businesses would be like, Oh, Rob, come on, dude. Like just, you know, this and that. And I'm like, well, you know, like when I'm a shopper, I'm not, I'm not the just, you know, employee, you know, like I, I definitely have my critiques on, you know, when I'm going to websites that I shop on and, uh, but you know, I, I don't, I can't really say that I, there's a time when I don't go looking for the best deal, but I'm also, I'm I'm someone that you would label in your CRM, Rob Hammett, discount affinity check. You know? When you win the lotto and you're still doing that, I'll call you out for it a little bit. Um, for right. now, I, I think we'll give you a pass. <laughs> I'll, right. I'll, I'll let I the like listeners uh, pass judgment on you, but I won't. I, I like the chances on that. Yeah. Yeah. See? Uh, <laughs> and, you know, so I know one of the ways that some of these promos come up, it's not just traditional marketing or... Uh, through some kind of you know pop up or modal, but uh, abandoned cart campaigns. So there are those campaigns that track you down, whether through email or another medium, to say, hey, you you know you added to cart, but you didn't check out. Uh, do you want to come on back? And some sometimes there's a discount available through that. Uh, I think when you do that, in some ways you do teach customers that if they add to cart and wait a day, that they'll get a coupon. So don't buy on the spot, which is a little risky. But I wonder. Uh, you know, for those, for a lot of brands, especially those that don't offer the coupons, were the shoppers just going to come back anyway? Uh, is it a placebo effect? It makes, you know, makes us in the industry feel like we did something, <laughs> uh, or, yeah. or, you know, is it really driving the customers back and getting them to complete a purchase that they would not have otherwise? You know, I think that, the placebo effect is a very um, real thing for not only card abandonment campaigns, but a lot of things, right? Like if someone is more inclined to engage on a certain level of the brand, then they're probably more engaged to take the next step and they're probably going to purchase. And, you know, I'm like just ruining attribution models all over the place. But, uh, but you know, the, those shoppers, specifically card abandonment, um, they tend to be not always, but they tend to be uh, in the category of, like I just said, discount affinity. So they're waiting on that card abandonment campaign or whatever the win back is and should be designated as such in the future. The main thing, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, but the main thing to understand about these win back strategies is that they're important. They work, but they don't need to be applied to everyone, be, everyone because other people don't necessarily need that to convert. And you, you don't want to just, you know, give out a 20% discount to everyone when only half the people needed it. Cause that's going to hurt your, your, your margins. Absolutely. And, you know, discounting is a risky business because, you know, people sometimes uh, have a hard time thinking about it. You know, that you think of, Oh, you know, you gave 10% off, um, that doesn't sound like so much, but when you think about, well, your profit margin was only, you know, 30% on, on that and you start mm -hmm. to crunch the numbers and how much did you really just give away? Well, you gave away a much higher percentage of your profit margin uh, than you really, you gave away a third of it. Um, that's and you painful. established yourself and you established yourself as, 
yeah. discounting across the board, your you know. discount brand. Um, I am not tracking exactly what's happening with it this time around. I know that uh, in the early 2000s, when travel was down, uh, and uh, you know, especially in places like New York, um, and people needed to figure out what to do. I remember hotels in New York. Um, I was still living up there at the time. They would close down floors. They would stop mm. the elevator from going. They'd cut the you know some of the the lighting, air condition, whatever they could, cut it back. Um, you know, not not send uh, you know people to freshen up those rooms more often than needed. Uh, and they would just close them down rather than um, drop the price too much. Because once you taught a a, uh, a traveler that this Times Square hotel is only worth $99 a night, getting them back to paying $399 a night was going to be uh, just super difficult. Um, yeah. And so there, there's something to be said for it. And I think some industries have experience with that, with we'll wait it out rather than give away the farm. Um, because yep. it's it's very hard to get back to where you want to be, even when you're sitting on inventory or you're really hungry to. There are times to close things out or uh, to, to act differently. But I, I think that those are big conversations to be had. Um, totally. You know, and I, I know that um, your team has a lot of integrations uh, with different marketing platforms that are very specific to e-commerce. Uh, anything new or exciting because you know when i think about uh multi-channel marketing marketing through different mediums and different things uh you know I, i've seen some things slow down and i know we touched on push notifications earlier i can't think of a single website that i allow to send me push notifications through my browser someone does um but i i know that there was maybe some promise there but it hasn't necessarily become a top um method for communication uh, is your team seeing per particular growth or anything in interesting uh, on the horizon uh, when it comes to some of this outbound marketing? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that there's always a power grab going on and it, and it's, everything is having a moment. It kind of flares up and it kind of goes away. And, you know, email is, seems to be old, reliable, Right. Like, and, and as in terms of outbound channels, push notifications, people seem to get pretty excited about it, but it hasn't really, I think there's a place for it. Push notifications. I really do because, uh, back in stock, right. If something's out of stock and you really want it, that's a good opportunity to sign up for push notifications and not clutter your inbox. Right. So I think there's a moment, I think people need to dial in what that moment is before they really uh, get into it. But I myself am very excited about our, we have a, a new version of our platform that's going to be launching in uh, Q1 this year, uh, next year, sorry. And and I'm very deep working on it with our product team. We I can promise that it is going to change the way that outbound marketing in terms of capturing leads, uh, on-site messaging, conversion rate optimization, it is going to change how brands build create, launch that type of content on their site. And so we're very, very uh, excited. Um, and on the other side, I'm surprised to see Facebook Messenger slowed down, you know, and again, like, you know, there's always a power grab going on. So who knows, it could, it could mount a recovery. Um, though I still think it works for certain uh, segments and, you know, hot take alert, you know, a lot of people might not like this, but I wouldn't be surprised to see SMS slow down again because we have seen it come up before and be this new exciting thing. And then people get tired of it. Marketers overuse it and it slows down again. So I would not be surprised to see that happen again. Well, um, I'm seeing, I mean, oddly enough, and I think this applies across the board. It's not specific to one industry, but direct mail is up. Uh, yeah. You know, that everyone got burnt out of it and everyone moved to digital and everything else, which was perfectly... You know, maybe not great for the post office and and some printing companies and others in the industry, but generally speaking, environmentally yeah. friendly to go digital and uh, yeah. you know a lot more trackable by the user. And did they open the email? Did they click? Did they? You know, you could get a lot more insight and data on average than than with um, than with more traditional marketing. But at the same time, without 
my mailbox as stuffed as it used to be, companies have figured out again, well, you know, if he's not getting 20 postcards with junk a day and he's only getting one or two, he might actually read them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like displacement, you know, like that's, that's, that's sort of some, a thought as you're speaking, like that word just came to mind because that's what the cutting edge of marketing is display is displacement and finding where people aren't being communicated with that much, but where you can reach a large amount of people cheaply. Right. And to put it kind of like in blunt, non-sexy marketing terms, like how can you reach the most amount of people in an effective cost basis and people and marketers figured out that, Hey, people have totally bailed on mailers. People love handwritten notes. So let's go back to that. And so that'll kind of that, that pool will fill up and then, Mm -hmm. People will have abandoned Facebook Messenger, right? And so they'll say, what if we tried Facebook Messenger? Oh, that's a unique approach. So to me, it's just this displacement that's constantly happening. In, in the, in the marketing it's space. the same with TV. I mean, I don't know. I, I could tell you the only time this year that I've watched television commercials, uh, you know, because there's streaming and on demand and DVR and anything else. But, uh you know, when there's a hurricane coming, I'm in South Florida. I, I turn on the Weather Channel for a few minutes. I, I like to right. see yeah. what's going on there. I mean, I don't necessarily need to see people being uh, drenched in the rain and, and blown in their uh, <laughs> in their windbreakers yeah. and what have you uh, in, in live time. But you know, there's something to be said for getting up to date data in a way that's comfortable in the background and, and whatever. But that's about it. Um, you know, and and so you know, I wonder. Uh, I think that I don't think I'm unique in that. I think that there are lots of consumers um, that are also there might be television commercials, but we're not seeing them anymore. Um, right. And so, you know, in some ways, it's it's about chasing that consumer to where where they're available. And I think the hard part um, for marketers today uh, is the variation is that they're not in just one place and they're not going to going to all respond the same way in one place. So it yeah. can't just be about. You know, there's not just three television stations to advertise on anymore. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, challenges ahead. But uh, I think that's for at least for you and I, that's half the fun is figuring out what the next great thing is going to be. Um, so excited to hear about some of those things you were alluding to coming down the pike. Hopefully we'll uh, we'll have you on again to hear more about that next year as, as some of that comes to fruition. Um, you've yep. been very generous with your time. Uh, I, I think it's been you know, just, you know, a lot of thought provoking content for our listeners. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Let's see. Um, this year is unique to most. Um, I recently run, I, I'm just thinking of something that might be a nice little, like just something to close this out. That might be helpful information about the upcoming holiday season or the holiday season that we're in right now. Um, uh, I think it's important to realize that look into history, right? 2009, when we were recovering from the economic crash, it took up to two years for the, for purchasing behavior to fully recover from that. And so I did a bit of research there and presented on it and to our customers. And we talked about how things that improve home life, that are self-care, that are wellness, fitness, um, people are still purchasing, but they're focusing on that. So those, those dollars that they're spending are precious. They're going to focus on things that, that improve the home and improve the self and in, might improve the people they care about. So I would keep that in mind when you're trying to put together your holiday doorbuster deals this year um, and, and understand that there is more than just early access to Black Friday. There's all of December to run your upsells and cross sells and your and your discount ladders and things like that. And then there's also January. So um, this year has presented a lot of unique challenges, mainly big box retailers coming fully online. So they're competing just as much as the mid the midsize and enterprise businesses that have been online. They're competing for keywords. They're competing for ad. Um, um, they're bidding on ad space and you know, so it's 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 a much more competitive world, but it's exciting for e-commerce. So just realize that, you know, um, understand, use use empathy to understand where people are going to spend their money this year. Um, and you know, we're always you know the Just You Know team is always around to assist with strategy, 
can always reach out to me if you have any uh, questions about uh, anything e-commerce marketing related. Um, other than that, I want everybody to have a very successful Q4 and let's get that vaccine so we can all start traveling. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> uh, I'll be looking forward to it. Well, uh, Rob, thank you for joining. Thanks for all the insights to our listeners. Uh, thank you as always. Uh, subscribe wherever you're catching this this uh, episode, and uh, you know you can reach us or follow us at Jet Rails uh, across social media. And with that, happy sailing. Stay safe out there. <laughs>